Kipele gani wapi na msichana wa night class? Excuse Welcome to Self Care Tips. In our last episode, we covered eye makeup precisely and we got this stunning and gorgeous look. Today, we're going to cover the full face makeup. We're going to talk about how to apply foundation, we're going to cover lipstick and so many things to give you a full, gorgeous face. Application of foundation a primer is used which forms a base to hold the makeup well. It seals the skin imperfections like pores, open pores, and other bumps on the skin. Its purpose is to give the makeup a very smooth base to hold on to. And it also makes your makeup last and last all day long. When choosing foundation colors, always consider your undertone. For example, Purity, our model here, has what we call a warm undertone or yellow-based undertone. So when you're looking for your foundation, consider your undertone. And that is why we have makeup artists like Maria who assist in getting your perfect match of the skin. Nothing looks worse than using the wrong shade of foundation because it gives you a demarcation line, that line around your neck which really, really does not look flattering at all. But with expert guidance, you're able to select your right color. The best thing to use is this um, tabbing brush. As you can see, she's dabbing the foundation onto the skin and it works ideally because it's able to cover well. Use this brush in these dabbing motions so that your foundation sits well and is able to give the perfect coverage. The next step is the use of powder. Powder is used to set the skin, to set the foundation on the skin, to prevent shine and it's the finishing touch. It gives the skin a very velvety, matte appearance, very smooth and can be used on oily skin or if you're going to be behind the camera, you can always use powder to give that impartation of velvety. A little bit of powder is used under the eyes to set the under eye concealer before the final touch which will be the lipstick. A light touch, a gentle touch is applied. Nude is brown combined with a slightly brownish pink which gives the perfect pout or a perfect shade of lipstick which is ideal for a working day or for going out. The makeover would not be complete without a burst of setting spray or fix, makeup fix. This is a fixative which will keep your makeup lasting all day. This has been Self Care Tips. I am Irene Jaroge. story to share with KBC? Get in touch swiftly on email newsroom at kbc.co.ke Call 0723-892-654 or 
good evening to you. Thank you so much once again for choosing KBC Channel 1. You're just in time for the latest in Kenya and beyond borders. The political atmosphere in the country keeps getting hotter. Deputy President William Ruta was in Nyanza and the ODM leader Raila Odinga is also promising an economic recovery under his leadership. A lot of promises shaping the campaign trail for the 2022 general election. We got details of that story and much more, including also an important conversation. Kiria, welcome back first of all. Thank you very much. <laughs> what more should we expect? Absolutely. We are also focusing on the ongoing situation in terms of school fires. Mm -hmm. And the Ministry of Education is calling for the enforcement of every policy adopted to contain indiscipline in uh, secondary schools or rather in, educa in the education sector. Uh, we'll be talking about that and also an inspiration for you as we speak to Dr. Kennedy Hongo, uh, Head of State Commendation or HSC as a title. Mm -hmm. And he is a mentee of uh, Geoffrey William Griffin uh, from Starehe Boys Center, you know the founder of Starehe Boys mm. Center. Wow. Um, so he's an educationist, he's a motivational speaker, and now serving as an administrator in uh, Professor Nyang Nyong's government. We have that conversation lined up for you tonight. All right, that and much more coming up, but first let's get the top stories. Trials of campaigns. Deputy President's tour of Kisumu marred by chaos as leaders condemn hooliganism. Just what is ailing the education sector? Ministry asks key stakeholders to go back to the drawing board. And don't prosecute me. Kitui governor commits to pay medic salary arrears. Welcome to the broadcast. My name is John Jacob Curia, and of course doing this with uh, Safin Cheng. And we begin our conversation tonight uh, with a political story as uh, political heat continues to go up. And Deputy President William Ruto's second day in Luanyanza uh, tour was characterized by pockets of chaotic scenes at Kondele area of Kisumu City. Police were forced to lob tear gas canisters to disperse a rowdy crowd that pelted the Deputy President's convoy with stones. As weekly for catch reports, seen Scenarios were, such scenarios were calmer, though, in Migori and Homa Bay counties. Deputy President William Ruto's second day in Luonyanza began at the famous Kondele area of Kisumu City. Crowds were initially calm as they waited for the arrival of Ruto's entourage. But things suddenly went south when the convoy made its way to the Kondele roundabout, forcing the police to lob tear gas canisters. That, however, did not deter the deputy president who went on to condemn the ugly scenes. In a statement, National Police Service said no injuries were reported, but several vehicles were damaged attributing the incident to tension caused by alleged distribution of campaign logistical funds among local groups. <laughs> Nakuru Governor Lee Kinyanjui also condemned the incident, saying presidential hopefuls should move around the country without fear of such incidents. If we allow violence to define our politics, then we are going to be a nation of goons. Ruto, who is on the campaign trail to popularize the bottom-up economic model and his 2022 presidential bid, later visited Migori and Homa Bay counties, where the reception was warmer. Racing roadside rallies in Rongo, Uriri, Awenda towns, and later Homa Bay, Ruto called on area residents to make wise choices. <laughs> Reporting from Homa Bay County, I am Wycliffe Okage. 
All right. Yeah. Remember, we are having uh, some of these stories also posted on our website, www.kbc.co.ke. Plus, you can interact with us on social media at KBC Channel 1. Anu Wangeshi is our sign language interpreter. Let's stay with the political matters. ODM leader Raila Odinga says he stands a better chance of turning around the country's struggling economy. Speaking at Orange House, where he received defectors, Raila told Kenyans to be ready for an economic revolution under his leadership. Zainab Said with details of this story. Speaking after receiving ANC defectors from Meru, among them former permanent secretary Mukiri Kirinya, the ODM leader said he's focused on seeing the country on the first lane. The opposition chief, however, urged Kenyans not to be distracted by non-issues, promising all-inclusive government if he ascends to power. <laughs> Tuwashe kugombana hapa na pale kwa mambo madogo madogo mambo madogo madogo mambo hiku makubwa kubwa kubwa ya natuweza kufanya. Dismissing claims that he is unsellable in the Mount Kenya region, Raila called on Kenyans to maintain peace and avoid tribal politics. Ito fa uti wetu mba tukunayo ya kiloga ya kimila ni utajiri wetu. Unity in diversity. That is our heritage. And that is our pride. We should be proud to be Kenyans. This is what we should be. With all the members from Meru region joining ODM today, vowing to support the party's leader presidential bid, his brother Oburu Odinga used the podium to urge other parties and party leaders willing to join ODM to do so, even without dissolving their mother parties. Meanwhile, ODM presidential aspirant Jimmy Wanjigi has asked the ODM National Election Board to reopen the contest for presidential ticket following its suspension in February this year. We are asking for one thing and one thing alone. We are trying to invigorate this party with democracy from the top right down to the lowest elected seat. Right here with me are the chairman of all those regions who want one thing and one thing alone, to see this party grow and succeed in democracy, its quest for power, and also its quest for transparency. For Prime Edition, I'm Zainab Said. Now the Ministry of Education has directed all regional and county education directors of education to strictly comply with the basic education regulations of 2015. These regulations give guidelines on how learning institutions should handle cases of uh, mass indiscipline. Basic Education Principal Secretary Julius Juan says the Ministry has noted with concern the rising cases of students unrest and arson being witnessed across the country. In a circular released on Wednesday by Ali Learning and Basic Education Principal Secretary Julius Juan, the Ministry of Education directed boards of management of schools to convene meetings to discuss matters of discipline and share the information with the County Education Board for action. In addition, no school will be allowed to admit students who have not been formally released by their previous schools. Learning institutions have also been tasked with ensuring there is adequate security around the clock within their vicinity and liaise with the Ministry of Interior to fortify security. Schools will also have to establish adequate channels of communication with learners for addressing students' grievances. The Ministry affirming that it will not undertake repairs and renovations of schools as a result of students' unrest. For Prime Edition, I'm Ben Troyan Jewel. And now to Kitui County, where the governor, Charity Ngilu, has undertaken to comply with a court order requiring her to pay Kitui County doctors their five-month salary arrears. The Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Union, who had filed an application for contempt of court against Ngilu, the county service board chair and the chief executive officer, have said they will withdraw the suit after the medics receive their dues. <laughs> County Governor Charity Ngilu was on Wednesday before the Employment and Labor Relations Court. Ngilu and two county officials appeared before Justice Monica Mbaru to explain why they had failed to pay 20 doctors serving the county. 
some doctors who left the county in 2018 after we had just employed them and they went to study, which is a very good thing. But they left the county without services, healthcare services. So when we asked them to either come back so that we, they can continue giving services or leave so that we can hire others, they decided not to come back. So we hired others and we released those ones. So they brought us to court. The three had an application of contempt of court for failing to adhere to the orders issued by the same court on October 5, 2021, directing the county government to release salaries for the doctors whose pay had been withheld since July while they were on study leave. The doctors in the application had termed the move as malicious and unlawful, adding that they were not consulted when the decision was made. He has been very magnanimous. He has agreed to pay the doctors within 30 days. Thank you very much. We've had amicable uh, discussions and we're going to further our discussions even beyond this particular day that we're in court today. And I, I believe most of these, uh, the, the coming back to court or being in court again will be a thing of the past after most of the discussion we're going to have uh, from this day. The case will be mentioned on December 10th, 2021 to confirm compliance by the county government. For Prime Edition, I'm Ben Troenjue. Moving on to nominees to the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. We'll have to wait longer to know their fate after the National Assembly on Wednesday failed to take a vote on the matter um, following uh, concerns of ethnic composition. A section of legislators opposed to their nomination saying it would go against the spirit of the Constitution. Approval of a Colonel retired Alfred Mutueta Mushimba and Monica Wanjiru Muriu's nomination to the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission is still pending before the National Assembly. Debate on their suitability as recommended by the Justice and Legal Affairs Committee was inconclusive. I support that these people, these nominees, should be approved, but members should ventilate and say especially something about ethnic composition, about people to serve in public office. Garissa Township Member of Parliament Aden Dwale opposed the duo's nomination, saying it contravenes the Constitution. If we approve these two nominees, it will be contrary to Article 10 of the Constitution on national values, inclusiveness, non-discrimination, and protection of the marginalized communities. How come that Dr. Daba was replaced from either the people of the Rift Valley or Western or the mountain? I oppose and I say somebody should go to court and challenge this. His sentiments, however, did not go down well with some members. Leo hapa, wengine wanaanza kuongea ya kuwa mabaadhi ya majina. Baadhi ya majina, tena angalia, angalia kwa hikma zao. Tena wanajua na vipengele katiba. Vipengele ambapo kwamba miaka yote tulikuwa tukizungumza hapa. Ya kwa wapwani, hawapatiwi na fasi. Ya kwa ndugizetu kutoka North Eastern, hawapatiwi na fasi. Ya kwa ndugizetu kutoka Luo Nyanza, hawapatiwi na fasi. Leo, kwa sababu imekuwa sawa kwa wengine, Muna sahau ya kwa haya mefika hapa kwa sababu ya nunyini. Na lazima mukubali. Makosa mulo yafanya kwa wa Kenya Especially on the basis of this honorable speaker It is purely aligned And when you look at whoever has, has come in Immediately the predecessor has come from the course honorable speaker And the other one has also come from the, the mountain honorable speaker Therefore in my view it's important we support this report Honorable members we will move to the next order Because of uh, some circumstances that will have to be to cons have this one considered the question be put in the next sitting mshimba and wanjiru were nominated by the president to replace former commissioners daba maalim and rose masharia who resigned two months ago kamchemenzam for prime edition 
Now moving on, ICT Cabinet Secretary Joe Musheru says the government is committed to the protection of the personal data of all Kenyans. Musheru says the digitization of services has placed data protection at the core of government business. Musheru spoke during the launch of the Office of the Registrar of Political Parties Strategic Plan. Data protection remains one of the most contentious issues in the country. The recent appointment of the data commissioner was viewed as a step forward in providing some much-needed comfort to Kenyans and their data. ICT Cabinet Secretary Joe Musheru says the government is committed to ensuring that personal information remains secure at all costs. As a country, today we are going through many situations where data is being used and uh, the data commissioner is also dealing with the issue of you know, digital lenders who are using some of the information that has been provided to call others and uh, you know, find uh, ways of getting people to pay. So they're giving uh, some data out and I know that the office is working hard to make sure that that data is protected. And so I can assure everyone that as a government and as a country, we will take all this uh, data use very seriously and ensure that people are only using your data where it is allowed. On Wednesday, the Registrar of Political Parties launched an online platform where Kenyans can verify their political party membership. We are easing the process of nomination, especially for candidates, and are strengthening parties so that their data become credible and every person will not, not come saying that uh, uh, our data, our political parties register is not credible. In the next election, we expect that political parties are going to use their membership data as their basis for party primaries. The online platform is designed to prevent fraudulent registration of Kenyans into political parties. Now let's focus on the COVID-19 situation in the country. And Kenya has recorded 178 new cases of COVID-19 from a sample size of 7,091 tested in the last 24 hours. According to the Ministry of Health, the country's positivity rate is now at 2.5%. From the latest statistics, the youngest is a two-month-old infant and the oldest is 84 years. Total confirmed cases um, are now 254,057. And uh, in uh, cumulative tests of conduct are 2.7 million. No death was recorded in the last one day and the fatalities remain 5,314. Globally, data from the John Hopkins University shows more than 251 million people have been infected and over 5 million people have died. From the COVID-19 situation in the country, and the Kenyan and Canadian governments have partnered to provide uh, vocational training uh, for children under the juvenile justice system. Public Service and Gender Affairs Cabinet Secretary uh, Professor Margaret Kobia says the government is committed to providing adequate support for children currently uh, serving time to mold them into productive members of society post-rehabilitation. Professor Kobia was speaking at the Kabeta Rehabilitation Center when the institution received training equipment worth 20 million shillings donated by the Canadian government. The equipment, which included sewing machines, will be integrated into the rehabilitation program. The government currently runs 14 children remand homes, nine rehabilitation schools, five rescue centres and two reception centres. Here, do they have to get into the justice system? Can we make sure that we can keep them out of the system so that we rehabilitate them there. As a task force, we actually call out for diverting children before they get into the justice system. But even then, we need those rehabilitation programs to support that diversion. It's a spirit of especially not leaving anyone behind, especially the children regardless of their circumstances. The government is also continuously reforming child justice system for effective rehabilitation and reintegration of children offenders. Optimal rehabilitation and, and the reintegration of the offenders requires a well-designed program to produce well-adjusted and responsible children, in particular to have a very positive out outlook as, and also invest in that in those reform because the cost of not uh, investing in reform is more expensive than if we had done it 
So it is not like a by the way kind of a program. It's a government intended program through the children's services department. All right, and uh, this is the point where we take our first break on Prime Edition tonight. But remember, there's still more lined up ahead uh, for you. Current Kibate will be coming with the sports, and Cynthia Nyamai is also getting ready to bring you the latest in the world of business. But before that, John Jacob Kiria will be having that conversation we told you a little bit earlier. He will be having a sit-down with Dr. Kennedy Hongo, an educationist and motivational speaker. That conversation is something to look forward to as we take this break now. Kenya Defense Forces, KDF, announces the recruitment of General Service Officers, GSO Cadets, Specialist Officers, General Duty Recruits, Trades Men and Women, and Constables scheduled for the month of November 2021. Listen to Radio Taifa during the entire month of November 2021 for details of the recruitment process. Then grab your local newspaper, The Daily Nation, 7th of November. The Star on the 5th of November, while The Standard will have those details 14th of November and 9th of November on my gov inside this standard newspaper. The People's Daily on the 8th of November and 12th of November. Remember, no one can influence the recruitment process because bribery and other acts of corruption are against the law. Report any suspicious activities or characters to the nearest police station or military camp or call hotline numbers 0726419709 or 0120300599. KDF recruitment is absolutely free to all. Uzalishaji wa viwanda huwa na manufaa mengi katika nchi moja wapo ikiwa ni kubuni nafasi za kazi kuchangia katika mapato ya kitaifa na kuwafanyi kazi wa viwanda This big four agenda provides young persons with multiple avenues for self-fulfillment, economic empowerment, dignified living, as well as service to Kenya. So we're very, very excited that a country such as India has acquired syringes from Kenya. <laughs> Tazama KBC Channel 1 ijumaa hii saa mbili unusu wane manufaa na ukuzi wa viwanda nchini Kenya chini ya uongozi wa Rais Uhuru Kenyatta. Welcome to Extra Mile. Tonight we speak to Dr. Kennedy Hongo, HSC. That's a head of state commendation. Uh, he's a mentee of Dr. Geoffrey William Griffin, uh, the founder of Sterehe Boys Center. He's a missionary, an educationist, a motivational speaker, a preacher, a politician, <laughs> a private secretary to the governor for Kisumu County, Professor Nyang Nyongo, and also in charge of town management. Dr. Karibu Sana. Thank you very much, my brother John. Yes. What a great honor to be here today. Yes. After very many years, mm -hmm. but I'm so glad to be given another chance at mm. KBC. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, probably because we will dwell a bit on issues of education, because they're very important. But begin by painting a picture for us how it was like to be under um, uh, Griffin, um, again, being his mentee. And at some point interacting with him while you were in the institution um, at Starehe Boys Center, 
and even to his last moment his last breath you were with him tell us how it was to be uh, how it was you know working with uh, dr griffin first of all my brother mm. i must ad admit mm. that uh, jeffrey william griffin was one of the best men that this country has ever produced mm. even though he was a white man okay. but i always say he was a white black man that is one thing unique about him that he was a man of british descent but born in kenya growing up in kenya understanding us for who we are mm. and finally doing whatever he did for the good of this country of all men and women that i've ever met mm. if you would want to talk about a passionate man a really role model a man of integrity a man who was what he said mm -hmm. and what he was mm. his word and his character his activities were synchronized mm. he is not a person who would speak what he would not do and he's not a man who would speak to impress you he would speak the truth for the truth's sake mm -hmm. he always taught us that do what is right for the sake of right mm. the other thing that he i would remember so well of griffin was his level of patriotism one of the things that he told us was given a coffee cup to wash wash it better than it's ever been washed before mm. in other words given any job to do any opportunity to serve give your very best those are things that to date i still remember and the mm. other thing would say that you know second is good but first is best in other words aim for the best at all times and i'm sure these are values he instilled in you as his students at starehe boys center but whenever you look at starehe boys center there appears to be another chain of values um that exists within starehe and when you try to backtrace them they are all traced to uh dr griffin other than you know honesty and working hard what other values did dr griffin instill in his students at starehe boys center first and foremost mm -hmm. he was like a father to all of us mm. in fact one of his pride was speaking the words such as i'm the only man who has so many children without a wife mm. <laughs> most of us would have mothers but he was so proud of himself as a father mm. so he provided that fatherhood to many many of us and oh. so us as his children so like a caring father you'd want to do the best for your family mm. and i believe that also motivated him and the other thing that was so wonderful about him he was a role model he led from the front he never asked you to do what he himself would never do mm one basic principle that i really appreciated about griffin was greatness in simplicity mm. just like jesus christ greatness in simplicity where you're willing to come down to the level of a person that you want to bring up mm. and that is the reason why that most of us saw him as the perfect role model so that value of greatness in simplicity which very few people do have but he had it he demonstrated it and then he showed that care and concern he worked for public good in other words he understood the very cardinal principles of life service, service. and contribution service and contribution yeah. and that is what of course has taken you to being the first chief of staff uh, in Kisumu County for governor and uh, the former governor um, uh, Jack Ranguma and his private secretary and now again after another administration you're serving as private secretary uh, to the governor who succeeded Jack Ranguma who is professor Anyang Nyongo but very interestingly when you talk about Dr. Griffin his value for education and never before has education been tested as it is being tested right now with the school fires we're seeing across the country and one wonders probably as an educationist yourself and a person who has learned values from uh, dr griffin what is the missing link in our education sector that we are finding ourselves at this point um where school fires are the order of a day how i wish how i wish that our country having produced a great man in the name of griffin mm. would not go too far to look for the best solution to run schools and even how to bring up young people he had it all he understood what it is to create a school that is a school mm. if you got into griffin's office over his head you'll find the words of aristotle that there is a form 
of education mm. that should be given to our children not because it is noble and necessary but because it befits a free man we have two forms of education mm. one form for the production of free men or free women another form for the production of enslaved men and enslaved women mm. people that are not free mm. people that are built from the level of mistrust to trust in other words you step into a school mm. and you begin from the level of mistrust you're not trusted so there's so many rules the do's and don'ts and basically you're like put in a jail so one of the things that griffin understood so well that i i prayed that our nation would understand mm. is that when it comes to the building of schools you have two models a gaul model a jail model or a prison model mm. or a home model it's a choice but most of our schools generally are run like jail mm. and that is the reason why we have problems <laughs> if you want to really minimize what do you mean problems they run, they run like jail they run like jail mm. well the moment you receive a letter the letter comes with the rules the thing that you must never do mm. and the thing that you are allowed to do mm. you walk into the school you are supposed to stick to the school rules that you don't even know about you are a new boy a new girl who has just arrived the dues are so many and the 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 rules of you must never wear this kind of clothes you have to be in this kind of you know griffin's letter was come to school come immediately number one you will not even see any school rule in your letter in the calling letter when you get into Starehe, you had a chance to make mistakes to learn and the first half term was basically learning mm. as a new child you're free to make any mistake mm. but you're being educated you're being taught you're being shown the do's and the don'ts this is the consequence of this that is the consequence of this mm. he gave you the chance to learn the value of trust mm that you are trusted you are an important person in this family if you are given a chance to know that you are important mm -hmm. chances are you will also behave in an as an important and yet doctor in the absence of you know a discipline in the absence of strict adherence to rules human beings will operate like they are in the jungle what is discipline first first of all mm. the definition of discipline as per the late dr jeffrey william griffin was discipline is no discipline unless it's self-discipline so right. people will never do what they don't know you'll never do what you don't know mm. neither will you do what you have never thought about or you can do something by accident so it is important first of all to convey a particular knowledge a particular information people must be taught people must be educated shown the way and then set the standards so you cannot expect me to first do what i don't even know so the first thing that you have to focus on is proper induction so you go to many uh, most of the schools that we have today and by the way i would want to say john that teachers head teachers are very important people in a country mm. because it is teachers by their students that determines the thinking of tomorrow mm. nearly all of us we are produce of those wonderful people that are called teachers so then we need our teachers to understand that the role they play sometime is even more important than our own mothers and fathers mm. as the saying goes in a country or in a place where everybody's blind let me cut you short the because there's something you talk about when you're talking about discipline and order um that is an established mechanism there must be you know teaching and probably that's where the problem is there that these be. children have no one to look up yeah, to yeah absolutely there mm. must be not just teaching but proper induction mm. we and then as we are inducting them we must also give them the understanding of why the why behind whatever is being done mm. why are we inducting you this way why are we guiding you to follow this path and not this other path mm. and one of the things that i believe uh, my mentor did well in was proper induction mm. and proper induction is not just by writing the rules these do do's and don't even the do's and the don'ts are okay for someone who's being inducted so that you know the consequence just like a child learning by touching fire then knows the consequence of mm. touching fire mm. is that it will burn you so 
proper induction so that you have the right knowledge, the right information, the right mindset, so that the consequence of all that, you are able to do what is right for the sake of right. You appear to suggest, Dr. Tari, um, that from the onset, we have gotten it wrong in terms of inducting students or children into school. And I'm asking, here we are. We are finding ourselves in a situation where schools are burning every day. If you were to advise stakeholders in the education sector you are a stakeholder yourself i am what would you do in fact the first thing i would do if if today i am invited to into any school the first thing i would do i would go there like a father to those children i would have a, a conversation with them i would sit with them i'll talk to them about their life and their future i will help them to understand the value of a school a school is not a place of suffering a school is not a place of just punishment. A school is one of the best places on earth because it is like an airport where you have a chance to fly to whichever direction you want to go. A school is like that great farm with all kinds of fruits and it is you to pick which what you want. Mm -hmm. So I will give them a perspective first. I will spend time helping them to understand that you know the purpose of life is a life of purpose. You are born into this world for a cause. You are not an accidental occurrence. And therefore when you are in a school we are simply here to try to unlock the world for you so that the real you would show up when time comes. So here we are only giving you possibilities and options of helping you to us understand the direction that your future should take. So that is the first thing that we must help our children to understand that a school is a great place. And then we don't just pick it. We've got to act it. We've got to do it mm. so that we as teachers, we as headmasters or uh, uh, heads of school, we have to show that by our conduct, by our actions, by our manners. So that is key sit with your children, have a talk with them. I want to say this. Stare under the leadership of the late Jeffrey William Griffin, mm. had even a school parliament and a school cabinet. Parliament met every Friday where we were able to discuss our internal affairs, our issues, our problems. If the thing that happened over the course of the week that you as a boy you never liked, whether it came from the side of teachers or from the side of the boys themselves or the director himself, we were able to sit as a family and talk about it. And Griffin would be able to defend his action or accept that oh i didn't see that i am willing to change all right let me take you back to the jail narrative you're the one yeah the jail, oh, the the gal, jail narrative you're the, the one gal, who brought it yeah, up the gal narrative something very interesting and in, we're talking about the running of the education sector and listening to principals and uh, teachers saying the crash program introduced after COVID-19 uh, could be probably exacerbating the situation as it were. I'm bringing that Jill um, narrative uh, that you've talked about. Do you think probably from the setting of this uh, crash program where people are trying to recover in one way or another added pressure or exerted pressure to the students in school? It is true because most of the time it is the f is fear and frustration that ultimately lead to stress, pressure, and any in a pressurized environment, mm -hmm. if you just strike it like that, it blows up. So, so much pressure, so much stress, and no mm -hmm. way to release it. What happens? What we are seeing. And this is a real challenge on our good teachers mm. and our heads mm -hmm. dealing with children that possibly don't have a way to get that pressure out mm. Mm. now how did the late griffin do it because normally and and if you look at the history of strikes in kenya and even burning of schools most of the time it was in second term mm. second term just when mocks were coming and now the real you is going to be known because we are beginning to do those exams that are revealing who is who and that was because of that fear, frustration, maybe a child has not been properly prepared and now he's confused and any small thing that, like a matchbox, a box and petrol in the room, you strike and it blows up. Mm. This is the time that, as I've said, real headmasters, real teachers, real parents, must find time to sit 
with their children all right and give them meaning to life all right as we wind up um daktari give him meaning to life but we must punish this incident of arson. The Ministry of Education is proposing that anybody who is involved in arson attacks is never given a chance to go back to school again. But there are others who are saying more punitive measures need to be instilled in the sense that, for example, um, in, an, in an incident of arson that has resulted to um, fatalities, that person is charged with first degree murder um, for a child who is in secondary school. Do you support or are there any rehabilitative measures we can take um, to keep this at bay? It cannot be a one track way. Okay. Yeah, it cannot be a, a one track way. Some people will change as a result of rehabilitation some people will understand their problem when they are punished sometimes we think that punishment and discipline are twin sisters or they are same mm. but there are people that learn by making mistake so yes we have to punish mistakes done but at the same time we also need to counsel some of these children we need to talk to them at the same time, it's not just the work of teachers alone, mm. even the parents and even the very government. One of the problem is there's a lot of bad manners around us. Bad manners, people behaving badly. And then suddenly when you've been behaving badly and then the next minute you appear to be very good, the person wonders, is a Paul suddenly become a soul or a soul mm. suddenly become a Paul. Mm. So if we've not been consistent in the way we do our things, then chances are we are not the right people to bring the necessary change. Mm. So we've got to find the right people who have got right manners, right character, right standards, and right value systems that then become the role model for our children. Mm. So that even the one that should be talking to them should be people that are worthy the salt, people that are real model in the real sense, mm. people that have a character, What's the point when kids know that you are a terror and then suddenly you want to talk to them about love? Mm. Will it work? So we've got to have holistic approach. Right. It may require concerted effort from all the stakeholders. I'm thinking, uh, you know, going back to the first bit of a question. Mm. Uh, these are young people, young minds. Yeah. But the proposal by the Ministry of Education is that once you're involved in arson, you're banished from school. You will never come back to the regular school system. Is that a justified the, decision? The, I don't know whether to say yes or no. What I want us to think about, John, mm. first of all, even as we make decisions, mm. one of the biggest problems is that we take adults' heads and place these big heads of adults onto the small toddlers <laughs> and expect the toddlers to see <laughs> the adults' view. Mm. That is one big problem. And that is why sometimes even in the, this very, very schools we are talking about, a child passes through a fence, two weeks home, and two rolls of barbed wire. Yeah. You know, certain, certain ways of doing things may not necessarily help us to achieve what we want to achieve. So first of all, as adults, let us recognize the fact that we are dealing sometimes with the children who are still thinking like children. Mm. So come to their level and let them see things from a child's perspective and it is from there that you then move them to the next level. Mm. So I would only pray that our leaders that are responsible for education would always remember that yesterday's gangsters could actually become today's angels. Wow. wow. And, and yesterday's angels could become today's devils. And let me or conclude. today's gangster could actually become a bigger gangster and, tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So as we handle human beings we must realize that people change there must always be an elbow room for change okay. though and finally let me say this john mm. i'm a very firm believer in the methodology of the late jeffrey william griffin the okay. system and methods that if anybody took time to understand the ways of that old man that left us mm. You will never go wrong with matters of education. Right. And Starai Boys Centre and School has proven the same mm. to me and to the rest of the world. Right. That when admins, a new administration that changed from those ways came in, that centre almost went to the graveyard. Okay. But when the few old boys came back 
three years ago, led by Joshua Mora, Fred O'Connor, and the team that they are working with, mm. and brought back those old ways of the late Griffin, mm. my friend, the great school, is on its way to the top. All right, shining lights. So it works. Terrible it center. works. The methods it, work. It works. So then, what works? Work on it. All right. Why reinvent the wheel? <laughs> what works? Work on it. Why yeah. reinvent the will? The jail mentality. Yeah. Um, so let's get out of the jail mentality Kennedy and Ohongo. come to the All right. home model. Okay. Jail mentality, home model, and I think that is the, that's the silver bullet uh, to end some of the problems we're seeing in our education uh, sector. And of course, with this brain, run for political office, will you? Let me say this. Very quickly. That's a very interesting question. Yes. Politics is not a dirty game. Yeah. It's the best thing is our lives. Okay. So everyone is a politician. Only a few are elected to become what they become. Okay. That's my belief. All right. So if I get a chance to be made an MP by the people, to be made a governor, to be made a president, I would go for it. If okay. I mean a, I get a person who wants to become any of those things, get in there and be the change we want to, All right. to, to see. <laughs> Dr. Kennedy Hongo, ladies and gentlemen, talking to us about, you know, the education sector and learning from the story of Dr. Uh, Griffin tonight. That's why we put a cap on Extra Mile. Uh, Simi Nyamai is up next with business. And after that, we have Karen Kibet with the latest in sports. To get Philippians 1 6 as your skis are tuned, dial star 811 star 965 hash. And I'm certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. To get Philippians 1 6 as your skis are tuned, dial star 811 star 965 hash. Star 811 star 965 hash. We take it on at the right time. Honorable Musalia Mudavadi. The Honorable Mutahi Kagwe. Chief Justice Martha Karambukom. This is KBC. He's yes. the voice of Kenya. Asking the right questions. I don't know how it made you feel as speaker who is presiding over a house where members can be compromised with 10,000 shillings. We keep our guests comfortable. A mission to ensure our audience gets a complete story. For a few hours or so, I thought this is it. My end has come. If really we want an end of this pandemic, we must fight. Our goal? To tell it as it is for the benefit of our viewer. Uh, and I'm sure uh, we will have good discussions All right. uh, that will make probably your viewers mm. understand KDF better. Okay. With 21 radio outlets. During a live interview on KBC TV, Chief of Defense Forces, General Robert Kiboshi. Naji mkuu kumara ya kwanza katika maujiano yake ya kipeke na runinga ya KBC Channel 1. And two TV stations covering over 90% of the entire country. The message always gets home. KBC, the home of on-air TV interviews. <laughs> Good evening, welcome to Business. I am Cynthia Nyamang. Now, the economy rebounded to register a 10.1% overall growth in the first half of 2021 due to the easing of COVID-19 restrictions. National Treasury Cabinet Secretary Kuria Tani says that this is despite the economy registering a negative growth of 0.7% in the first quarter of 2021, and it was still reeling from the effects of measures put in place to contain the spread of COVID-19. COVID-19. Ben Sonrioba has the report. Inflation increased from an average of 5.31% in the second quarter of 2020 to 5.98% in the second quarter of 2021. The high cost of living was as a result of the current drought that is affecting many parts of the country that has seen food prices increase. This despite the economy growing by 10.1% in the first half of 2021 
as the government gradually eased COVID-19 restrictions. Manufacturing, education, transport and storage and ICT were the key drivers of the economic growth. On sectoral performance, agriculture contracted by 0.9% in the first six months of 2021 due to decreased tea production from 143,000 metric tons in the corresponding period under review last year to 133 metric tons this year. The sector was cushioned from further slump by increased milk, horticulture and sugarcane production. The manufacturing sector grew by 9.6% in the second quarter compared to a contraction of 4.7% in the same period of 2020. The sector was driven by an increase in production of non-food products that stood at 12.2%. Credit advanced to enterprises in the manufacturing sector declined by 0.9% to stand at 1.3 trillion shillings in the second quarter of 2021. On trade, the current account deficit expanded by 28.2% from 85.9 billion shillings to 110.1 billion shillings in the corresponding quarter of 2021. The central bank retained the lending rates at 7% in the first and second quarter of 2021. Money in circulation expanded from 3.9 trillion shillings as at the end of 2019-2020 financial year to 4.1 trillion shillings as at the end of June 2021. Treasury predicts an improved economy in the last quarter of 2021 due to easing of more restrictions that includes lifting of the curfews. Benson drew by reporting for Prime Edition. And now to agriculture, where the National Cereals and Produce Board will scale up its grain testing and storage services to show up grain exports in the country. According to the NCPB, the grain testing and storage services are aimed at reducing cases of aclotostin and contamination to ensure grains export conforms to the high photosanitary international standards to easily access key international markets. Last year, the European Union announced that it will heighten checks on residue and aflatoxin levels on beans from a number of third world countries that included Kenya. The bloc had initially capped sampling of Kenyan beans at 5% but doubled the sampling to 10% as surveillance heightened. The double sampling saw a single test cost 20,000 shillings, a figure that increased the cost of grain production and considerably lowering farmers' earnings. To increase testing of grains destined for key markets, the National Cereals and Produce Board has signed an MOU with a Dutch-based control union certification and inspection limited that aims at easing market access to farmers. The collaboration involves open exchange of resources, personnel, information, knowledge and views between the two organizations. Among other services, farmers in the grain export subsector will also get advisories on post-harvest management services, drying, fumigation and pest control, inspection services and aflatoxin testing, among others. This, according to the NCPB, is expected to further increase accessibility of testing services to farmers, lowering the cost of testing and increase food safety in the country. Now, plans are underway to establish four informal manufacturing hubs in Voi, Mombasa, Nakuru and Kisumu to support innovators. According to Chief Administrative Secretary for the Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development, David Osanyi, the incubation centers will give impetus to manufacturing by reducing operational costs for small businesses and in turn boost job creation and the economy. There are four Biashara centers across the country. The Biashara center principle was anchored on the, the same uh, principle that runs the Huduma Center, only that this is a Huduma Center for businesses. Currently, Nairobi County hosts the first informal manufacturing hub, Kariobangi Light Industries. We've actually made it into a Biashara Center, where you can go in and find all our 18 parastatals seated and waiting to assist you. You can ask all the questions and get them. Mm. Be that as it may, there has been very huge investment in equipment at our Biashara Center in Kariobangi. Local manufacturers have been urged to take advantage of the manufacturing hub that is gaining traction for producing a wide range of machinery, including Porsche mills. 
We have plans to expand the Biashara centers to mm. all counties. Preliminarily, we hope that we will be able to get to 10 counties first. But we don't even want to go to those 10 counties until we have ensured that the four counties where we have established them mm. are functioning and working properly. Yeah. The centers aim at inclusion of entrepreneurship training to boost capacity and address challenges of industrial growth. Beneficiaries will receive training in production processes and in preparing viable business plans for prospective investors to tackle the challenge of finding seed capital. Regina Manyara reporting for Prime Edition. Well, that interview marks the end for business. Today, up next, Sports with Karen Kibet. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for keeping us up to date with the latest in the world of business. But it's now time for us to take a look at what's making headlines in the world of sports. My name is Karen Kibet. Now, on to our first story. The world under 2800 meter champion Emmanuel Wanyonyi has been nominated for the 2021 Male Rising Star Award by World Athletics ahead of next month's World Athletics Awards. The nominations reflect the many incredible performances that the sport has witnessed this year at the World athletics under 20 championships in nairobi the tokyo 2020 olympic games and other events around the world others who are nominated into the list include usa's sean burrell ethiopia's tadese woku france Sas sasha zoya and usa's Arion knighton the winner of the award will be announced on first this december he's coming under pressure from both sides and Yoni perfectly 143 oh. championship record Moving on, Athletics Kenya today held their third consultative forum with athletes, coaches, managers and other stakeholders from the eastern region at Chuka University in Tarakinithi County, similar to Ngong and Machakos. Hundreds of stakeholders from Meru, Embu, Isiolo and Tarakinithi were provided with opportunities to speak out their minds on banning issues in the athletics fraternity. One of the major issues that came to fore is gender-based violence against athletes and its impacts on the victim's performance on the track and field. A case women subcommittee chair Elizabeth Keitani said that athletes should speak up about the vice so that uh, it's nipped in the bud. We are getting some experts to try to counsel and advise our athletes whether they have gone to those heights of getting a lot of money, how they can go about uh, trying to, uh, to save and uh, try to put into kind of business the little bit they are getting. Moving on, the Kenya national judo team intensified training ahead of the Africa Judo Championships in Senegal set to commence on 17th of this month. The championship is also an opportunity for the judokas to earn points towards qualification for the scheduled 2024 Paris Olympics with the team expecting tough challenges from West African countries like Morocco and Egypt. It will be the team's first outing after missing out on the Tokyo Olympic slot in Dakar Africa open in November as well as the Budapest Grand Slam in October 2020. My expectations are high um, considering um, we have uh, quite a number of uh, judokas uh, who have uh, high altitude training, uh, high performance uh, center training. Uh, we expect uh, them to, to perform well. Matters football, Harambe Stars sensational striker Michael Olunga has said Stars are ready for a positive result against neighbors Uganda as the team is set to face the Cranes in a World Cup qualifier match this Thursday. The team which was last night hosted in a colorful dinner courtesy of Stars partners Mozart Bet left for Uganda today morning. <laughs> Harambe Stars will be seeking to rejuvenate themselves and register a win after failing to register a positive result in their last four World Cup qualifying matches. The team, which was hosted in a colorful dinner last night, has so far managed two draws and two losses in Group E. They will face Uganda this Thursday in Kampala before hosting Rwanda at Nyayo National Stadium on Sunday. It's important how we play and we show at home against Mali that we changed a lot uh, comparing to the first match that we 
were able to play good football. Uh, the only problem was in this match that we was not able to finish up our situations. An opportunity in Guinea to come back to represent uh, Kenya national team and to uh, Uganda and Rwanda. Uh, of course, uh, we don't have a chance to qualify, but uh, we have uh, uh, our pride to protect. You know, Trenda Kucheza, it's going to be East African derby, and uh, always a derby is a derby, you know. So we want to go out there, you know, and represent. So proud that uh, we called me up. I'll be thankful for the coach to believe in my qualities. Uh, and yeah, I'm so proud and uh, excited to start to start maybe my first game. Meanwhile, Football Kenya Federation President Nick Mwendwa has asked the government to step up its efforts of supporting the national team in international and global events. Mwendwa insisted that the Federation is keen on nurturing talent from the grassroots levels and called on stakeholders to focus on development of football and sham politicking. And it's very painful when people go out, point figures at us, don't do their jobs, don't make the pictures for us, don't get the boys to get here, don't do the job that they're supposed to attack us out of nothing. I want to tell you that this team will go, we'll make sure this team goes, we'll make sure this team goes, but it's their job, they are not officers to do their jobs. Thank you very much, Moki, for that report. And we sure do uh, wish Harambe Stars all the best in that World Cup qualifier. And that's how we wrap up the KBC Sports News. Let's do this all over again tomorrow, same time, same place. My name is Karen Kibet. Do have yourself a peaceful night. But I do hand you back to Kioria and Safin. All right, thank you so much, Karen Kibet, for the latest in the world of sports. And here we're just here to wrap it up. Allow me to appreciate Arnold Omondi. You, you've been streaming live on YouTube. You say, I respect the way KBC is broadcasting. Keep it up. And then we, wa we have here one Sheila Njeri. You say um, you enjoyed that interview by Kennedy Hongo. He's a sober man. Thank you so much for watching. And we really appreciate your feedback. I couldn't sample all of them. But that's how we wrap it up tonight all right um absolutely that's how we wrap it up tonight a quite an interesting conversation we had on the jail mentality problem you know education sector and moving from jail uh, mentality uh, to home mentality and that could be the silver bullet uh, to ending this strife we're seeing in the education sector up next is reggae <laughs>